I'd like to uh, wrap up my uh, remarks about uh, self-creation, self-invention, and the challenge of the uh, uh, eternal recurrence by saying that, that uh, uh, we need to remember that this, has to do, uh, that this has to do with what I mentioned later in the lecture, the love of fate. Loving the place you found yourself in history, and sometimes that's a difficult thing to do, and for me that's a quite personal remark that has to do with my own self-invention, is to try to love the place I found myself in history, like many other people now, is, uh, I, th I find that difficult. Uh, Nietzsche, on the other hand, uh, thought it might be difficult, but it was a challenge that we should attempt to meet. Uh, in this uh, uh, next set of remarks, I'd like to address uh, the will to power, and of course that gives me a chance to uh, address something that uh, I probably should have talked about in the opening lecture, because in a set of uh, lectures on Nietzsche uh, that in which we want to reach a, a, an audience, a, a very wide audience, we need to dispel some of the myths about Nietzsche's text and concerning Nietzsche. And one of the most prevalent, and certainly uh, uh, it's a widespread myth, you can, you can find it in many places, uh, is the myth uh, of the connect. Well, I, I want to first say it's a myth, and then I want to argue the, the danger and risk in Nietzsche's text that, because I use myth in a strong sense, that allows it to be possible. I want to discuss for just a moment the relation of Nietzsche's work to fascism. And the reason I want to do that is because the, the first sort of Americanized reception of Nietzsche involved the use of Nietzsche's text for propaganda purposes by various National Socialist Party hacks. Unfortunately, it belongs to the nature of propaganda even by the good guys who do counter-propaganda as if we knew who good guys were after all the events that occur. I mean, this, isn't, this isn't going to turn out to be a, a, you know, a, a defense of the fascists or anything. It's not. Uh, it, I hope it doesn't turn out to be a defense of any parties. You know? I wish them all equal luck. In the words of Nietzsche, whatever is shaky should be pushed over. Something is shaky. On a shaky foundation, his advice is to push it over. You know, it's, if it's not on a shaky foundation, then when you push, it'll stay there, it'll be okay. But if it's on a shaky foundation, push it over. In any case, uh, uh, the counter-propaganda uh, also involved Nietzsche, and, 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 and the British, uh, in their uh, efforts to combat uh, Nazi propaganda, uh, also pr participated in just like uh, the Nazis were valorizing certain remarks of Nietzsche's, uh, then the British were at the same time demonizing those remarks, and that couldn't help but affect the reception of his work in England. And since in the United States, as I may have earlier remarked, we're so in love with British intellectuals, we know they couldn't be wrong about anything just because of their damn accent. You just use that accent, and American academics begin to swoon and you know, they go into, into you know, almost orgasmic uh, reactions to what's being said. Uh, uh, we knew that this British reception of Nietzsche must mean that, that he's, you know, like the philosopher of fascism. Well, there are, there are elements in Nietzsche's text that open up onto the risk of a hideous new project <coughs> in which against a technological world, we re try to reinvigorate it through blood, steel, and a new human being, the famous overman, which I will discuss when I discuss the text of Zarathustra. That such a sort of clever interpretation could then be used for propaganda purposes is clear. It was. It's clear that it could be used that way. Uh, I don't think, uh, to be fair to the text of Nietzsche, that this use is one that can in any sense be authorized under older fairer standards of interpretation. However, I should say that those are the very standards Nietzsche himself attacked, older, fairer standards of interpretation. But by those hermeneutic standards of interpretation, the older, fairer ones, it would be fair to point out that Nietzsche always viewed himself as a good European rather than a good German. He, skeeped, he, just, skeeped, he just laid tons upon tons of abuse upon those narrow nationalists who 
were good Germans and always talked about the Teutonic forests. Once Nietzsche said, well, back to the forest with them then. You know, and they're, they're, they're just boring the hell out of me. I hope they go live in the forest. So that's sort of the way I feel about a lot of the rhetoric in the United States on the right today is, oh, it's so good, we'll just go live in the, you know, the go from coast to co shining coast and Bangor to shining Maine or whatever the hell you want to do. But uh, now Nietzsche just scorned this, uh, this German nationalism. It's, ha it's hard to imagine that someone so sensitive that the event that finally, uh, as it were, tripped Nietzsche off into madness, another topic that we'll talk about in the lectures that remain, the event that finally tripped him into madness was someone beating a horse with a whip. Someone that sensitive, with that sensitive a nature in a certain way, it's hard to imagine uh, would have done well had he lived long enough as a great propagandist for that gang of petty bourgeois thugs that took over Germany and became the Nazi party. So I think that that was a, a, a dangerous uh, misunderstanding of the text of Nietzsche. However, and this is the admission that I think is necessary to, to show the risk of the text. However, once you've introduced processes of radical self-creation and redirection, <coughs> left them wide open and then argued for the strongest possible misinterpretations you know, the ones that are the most creative, interesting, and new, clearly you've opened yourself up to the possibilities of violence, death, madness, and many other things as well. So that's the admission on the one hand, not that it needs to be admitted. I mean, we live in the 20th century, one of the most barbaric, per perhaps the most barbaric century in the history of the world. I mean, if there was a central fact to our century, it would be murder, killing of people by their people. So, uh, to take before the bar this one rather literate, cosmopolitan, quiet little man who wrote these rather exciting texts as some causative factor in that much larger process, I think is, uh, is overkill of a very high order. In any case, uh, his text does open on to the danger of fascism, but as I said, that for me is not an objection because dangerous and insane risks are taken in his text in other directions as well. And that many texts have risks, many interesting texts, many interesting bodies of work have, have risks and many uses. Uh, the, uh, the standard, though, Americanized pop line that Nietzsche was for the German Superman in Blonde Beast is just simple-minded. And so that's not a criticism. It's just, it just doesn't mean that there aren't lines in his work that are like that, but it's simple-minded. And that should be enough to, to move slightly past that. Uh, it's a simple-minded way to look at Nietzsche, far too simple-minded. Uh, and, and, and that's not, as I say, to, to get out of the, uh, the trap that Nietzsche's uh, text is full of risks. Uh, however, an odd thing has happened in, in the return of Nietzsche in our own time is that while at one time, uh, uh, he was uh, used for ideological purposes uh, in the uh, National Socialist and the Movement of Fascism. Uh, according to Bloom and other paleoconservatives of the current period, the return of Nietzsche in the 60s, and then what I might call his re-return in the 80s and 90s, has been scandalously anarchistic left-wing Nietzsche. So obviously this is a text that can produce many differential political effects because the Nietzsche denounced by Bloom is the person who argues for strong multiple interpretations, for recreating 